So for the past 20 years, I've been helping Malaysians and other Southeast Asians to speak better English. And through training thousands of Southeast Asians, I've discovered a very surprising truth. I've discovered that how well somebody communicates in English actually has very little to do with their English level. It has a lot to do with their attitude towards English. There are people out there who have a very, very low level of English and they can communicate very, very well. One of them that I remember was a student, a participant of mine named Faisal. He was a factory supervisor. English level very, very low. But this guy could just sit and listen to anybody very calmly, clearly, and then he could respond, absolutely express his thoughts beautifully at a very low level of English. So today I want to share with you what is so different about people like Faisal. How do they do it? And second of all, why is this so important, not only to you, but to your children, to your community, and to the future of Malaysia? And third of all, what's one thing you can do, starting today, if you want to speak with that calm, clear confidence that people like Faisal has? So first of all, what is so different? How do people like Faisal do it? So to answer that question, I'm going to take you back about 10 years, okay? So I was training staff at that time, and my daughter at that time was taking piano lessons. And I started to notice two really strong similarities between my daughter's attitude or thinking towards playing the piano and a lot of Malaysians thinking or attitude towards English. Now, first of all, I should tell you, my daughter absolutely hated piano, hated the lessons, hated practicing. This is my daughter practicing piano, okay? This is as good as it got. <laughs> this is the real thing. And she dreaded going to piano lessons because to my daughter, going to piano lessons, she was filled with this sort of dread because it was all about not screwing up, right? Because like for a lot of piano students, to both my daughter and her teacher, her success in piano was measured by how few mistakes she made. Now, at the same time, I noticed that a lot of Malaysians went into English conversations with the same sort of feeling of dread, this sort of feeling that they were going to be judged by how many mistakes they were going to make and whether or not they were going to screw up. Now, the second similarity that I noticed was to do with self-image. You see, my daughter, she knew what good piano sounded like, right? Because we've all heard good piano. And she knew what her level was, and she knew how long she'd have to play for to speak, to play like that. And a lot of Malaysians, I noticed, had this idea of what good, proper English is supposed to sound like, and what their, I see a lot of you nodding, and what their English sounded like, and how far they'd have to go to get there. And they also felt like they were, like my daughter, just bad, bad piano player, bad English speaker, right? My English not so good, la, cannot, sorry, ah, shy, ah, cannot, ah. So I could see these similarities, but I still couldn't figure out, okay, what is it about these people like Faisal that are so different that can just do it smoothly, calmly, with confidence? And one day I discovered that answer, and I discovered it quite by chance. It was a day when my computer broke down and I had to go to a cyber cafe. Now, okay, it was my first time and I discovered cyber cafes are disgusting places, okay? They're really gross, they're smelly, and they're filled with boys, and they're all playing noisy, violent games. They're just disgusting places. But I had to go there, so I sit down, and I start noticing this guy beside me, and I become very, very interested in this guy next to me. Now, this guy is playing this game that is basically, it's like shooting people until they die. And that's it, right? That's the game, right? And, and I'm noticing that this guy is not very good. He's like, in fact, terrible, right? Because I'm looking and I'm seeing like a lot of shooting and, 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 and not much dying, right? <laughs> but what really interested me was behind this lousy player, 
were three of his friends sort of standing there watching him play. And what I really noticed was, even though this guy was terrible, even though his friends were watching him, there was no embarrassment. There was no feeling of being judged. There was no shyness. In fact, quite the opposite. This guy's like totally focused on the bad guy, smile on his face. All he can think about is, is, is killing these guys, right? And I'm watching him and I suddenly realized this is it. This is the same attitude, attitude that people like Faisal have when they speak English, just like this guy. When Faisal goes into an English conversation, he doesn't feel judged. He's entirely focused on the person that he's speaking to and the result he wants to get. He's got no self-awareness, no thoughts about his own mistakes. Now, I want to share with you a real, true example to paint a picture of somebody who speaks English like they're playing piano and someone who speaks English like they're playing a computer game. And this is a true story. Happened to me. Um, a while ago, I was in a pharmacy. I had to buy Omega. My doctor said I should get Omega. And I go to the shelf. There's tons of Omega. There's Omega that's high in DHA, Omega that's high in EPA, and I don't know which one to buy. Now, the sales rep happened to be there, and I saw she was like this well-dressed professional woman. I walk over to her and I see this look as she sees me, this sort of, it's a look I recognize very well. Her eyes go all wide. It's sort of that panic, oh my God, I've got to speak to a native speaker and she's going to judge me and notice my mistakes. I go up to her and I explain my situation, which, which omega do I get? And she starts explaining to me everything about DHA and EPA you could possibly imagine. She speaks very quickly, goes all around in circles, and when she finishes, no idea what to buy. So I turn to the girl behind the counter. Now the girl behind the counter, I heard her before, her English level is very low. But when I walk over to her, this girl, there's no fear. In fact, she's just looking at me. You know that look? I, yeah, okay, so how? Right. <laughs> yeah, I've been in Malaysia a long time. <laughs> so I go up to her and I explain the problem, EPA, DHA. She looks at me, she says, okay, uh, uh, EPA for heart. DHA for brain. Your heart okay or not? <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah, my, I said my heart is really, it's, I think it's pretty good. She says, your brain okay or not? <laughs> I said, yeah, no, <laughs> no, my brain is not as good as it used to be. She looked, she said, okay la, you take Omega DHA, can? <laughs> Problem solved, right? So we've got two different kinds of communicators. We've got the one who's got a high level, but totally focused on herself and getting it right, and therefore very ineffective. We've got another one, low level, totally focused on the person she's talking to and getting a result, effective. And therein lies the difference. Now, why is this distinction so important, not just to you, to your children, but to the future of Malaysia and countries like Malaysia? And to answer that, let's take a look at who actually is speaking English in the world today, okay? So if we looked at all of the English conversations in the whole world taking place right now on planet Earth, we would see that for every native speaker, like me, there are five non-native speakers. And if we listen to every conversation in English on planet Earth right now, we would notice that 96% of those conversations involved non-native English speakers. Only 4% of those conversations are native speaker to native speaker. This is not my language anymore. This language belongs to you. It's not an art to be mastered. It's just a tool. 
to use to get a result. And I want to give you a, a real life example of what English is today in the world, real English today. This is another true story. I was at a barbecue a little while ago. This was a barbecue for engineers, engineers from all over the world. And uh, they were making hot dogs. Now, some of the hot dogs were regular hot dogs, and some were these, these cheese hot dogs, you know, with the cheese in the middle. French engineer is cooking the hot dogs, and he turns to this Korean engineer, and he says, uh, would you like a hot dog? <laughs> and the Korean guy says, yes, please. He says, uh, uh, do you want the cheese? And the Korean guy looks around at the table. He says, uh, I, I no see cheese. French guy says, ah, the, the hot dog is contains cheese. <laughs> Korean guy doesn't understand him, right? So the French engineer tries again. The, the hot dog is, um, is making from uh, with the cheese. Korean guy still doesn't understand. He tries again. He says, uh, the hot dog is coming, uh, is, um, coming from, no, the cheese is coming from the hot dog. <laughs> Korean guy cannot understand. Now, this Japanese engineer who's been listening to this conversation turns to the Korean engineer and he says, ah, ah, a cheese uh, integrator. <laughs> he understands. <laughs> okay? Everybody understands. So this is what English is today. It's just a tool to play around with to get a result, like a computer game. Now the challenge is that we know in schools all around the world, right, English is not really being taught like it's a tool to play with. It's still being taught like it's an art to master. And students are judged more on correctness than on clarity. Some of you might remember uh, the old comprehension exam in school. Does anybody remember in school when you would, you would get a question about a text that you read? You'd have to read through some text, right? And then answer a question to show that you understood the text. And this may have happened to you that you showed that you understood the text, but you got a big X because you made a little grammar mistake like this student. Now, this student clearly understood paragraph four, but no, not correct, because he left the letter N off the word environment. But in the real world, what would matter? In the real world, what would matter is, did you understand the email, or did you understand your customer, so that you can go ahead and take action? Now, the problem that I see here, over and over, is that people take the attitude they developed about English in school and they bring it into their adult life and into their work. And if you're in a stressful situation and you're having a conversation and you're trying to give a result to someone and say it correctly, your brain multitasks. It cannot do two things at once. And what I see is the brain just shutting down. And you may recognize these three symptoms of the brain shutting down. The first one is that your listening goes. Someone's talking to you and you're so busy thinking about how you're going to respond and, and express yourself correctly, you don't actually hear what the other person said. And I can see a lot of nodding in the audience. The second thing to go is your speaking. Your mind sort of shuts down, and that vocabulary you do know just disappears, and you, the words don't come out. The third thing to go is your confidence. And the worst thing about this is you may only be confident because you cannot express yourself clearly, but to the person talking to you, they may misunderstand this as a lack of confidence in your ability to do the job, to perform. So if you want to speak English like Faisal with that great confidence, here's the one thing that you can do. When you speak, don't focus on yourself. Focus on the other person and the result you want to achieve. Imagine a next generation of Malaysians all with that wonderful confidence in communication that Faisal has at any level of English. 
Because let's remember that English today, it's not an art to be mastered. It's just a tool to use to get a, a result. And that tool belongs to you. Thank you. People at the back, can you hear me clearly? OK, good. Have you ever held a question in mind for so long that it becomes part of how you think, maybe even part of who you are as a person? Well, I've had a question in my mind for many, many years, and that is, how can you speed up learning? Now, this is an interesting question, because if you speed up learning, you can spend less time at school. And if you learn really fast, you probably wouldn't have to go to school at all. Now, when I was young, yeah, school was sort of OK, but uh, I found quite often that school got in the way of learning. So I had this question in mind, how do you learn faster? And this began when I was very, very young. When I was 11 years old, I wrote a letter to researchers in the Soviet Union asking about hypnopedia. This is sleep learning, where you get a tape recorder, you put it beside your bed, and it turns on in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, and you're supposed to be learning from this. Uh, good idea. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. But Hypnopedia did open the doors to research in other areas, and we've had incredible discoveries about learning that began with that first question. I went on from there to become passionate about psychology, and I have been involved in psychology in many different ways for the rest of my life up until this point. In 1981, I took myself to China, and I decided that I was going to be native level in Chinese inside two years. Now, you need to understand that in 1981, everybody thought Chinese was really, really difficult and that a Westerner could study for 10 years or more and never really get very good at it. And I also went in with a different idea, which was taking all of the conclusions from psychological research up to that point and applying them to the learning process. What was really cool was that in six months, I was fluent in in Mandarin Chinese, and it took a little bit longer to get up to native. But I looked around, and I saw all of these people from different countries struggling terribly with Chinese. I saw Chinese people struggling terribly to learn English and other languages. And so my question got refined down to, how can you help a normal adult learn a new language quickly, easily, and effectively? Now, this is a really, really important question in today's world. We have massive challenges with environment. We have massive challenges with social dislocation, with wars, all sorts of things going on. And if we can't communicate, we're really going to have difficulty solving these problems. So we need to be able to speak each other's languages. This is really, really important. The question is, how do you do that? Well, it's actually really easy. You look around for people who can already do it. You look for situations where it's already working. And then you identify the principles and apply them. It's called modeling. And I've been looking at language learning and modeling language learning for about 15 to 20 years now. And my conclusion, my observation from this is that any adult can learn a second language to fluency inside six months. Now, when I say this, most people think I'm crazy. This is not possible. So let me remind everybody of the history of human progress. It's all about expanding our limits. In 1950, everybody believed that running one mile in four minutes was impossible. And then Roger Bannister did it in 1956, and from there it's got shorter and shorter. A hundred years ago, everybody believed that heavy stuff doesn't fly, except it does, and we all know this. How does heavy stuff fly? We reorganize the material using principles that we have learned from observing nature, birds in this case. And today, we've gone even further. We've gone even further. So you can fly a car. You can buy one of these for a couple of hundred thousand US dollars. We now have cars in the world that fly. And there's a different way to fly, which we learned from squirrels. So all you need to do is copy what a flying squirrel does, build a suit called a wingsuit, and off you go. You can fly like a squirrel. Now, 
most people, a lot of people, I wouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people think they can't draw. However, there are some key principles, five principles that you can apply to learning to draw, and you can actually learn to draw in five days. So if you draw like this, you learn these principles for five days and apply them, and after five days you can draw something like this. Now I know this is true because that was my first drawing, and after five days of uh, applying these principles, that was what I was able to do. And I looked at this and I went, wow! So that's how I look like when I'm concentrating so intensely that my brain is exploding. So, anybody can learn to draw in five days. And in the same way, with the same logic, anybody can learn a second language in six months. How? There are five principles and seven actions. There may be a few more, but these are absolutely core. And before I get into those, I just want to talk about two myths. I want to dispel two myths. The first is that you need talent. Let me tell you about Zoe. Zoe came from Australia, went to Holland, was trying to learn Dutch, struggling extremely, extremely a great deal. And finally, you know, people were saying, you're completely useless, you, you, you're, you're, you're not talented, give up, you're a waste of time. And she was very, very depressed. And then she came across these five principles. She moved to Brazil, and she applied them. And in six months, she was fluent in Portuguese. So talent doesn't matter. People also think that immersion in a new country is the way to learn a language. But look around Hong Kong. Look at all the Westerners who've been here for 10 years who don't speak a word of Chinese. Look at all the Chinese living in America, Britain, Australia, Canada, who've been there 10, 20 years, and they don't speak any English. Immersion, per se, does not work. Why? Because a drowning man cannot learn to swim. When you don't speak a language, you're like a baby. And if you drop yourself into a context which is all adults talking about stuff over your head, you won't learn. So what are the five principles that you need to pay attention to? First, there are four words. Attention, meaning, relevance, and memory. And these inter interconnect in very, very important ways, especially when you're talking about learning. Come with me on a journey through a forest. You go on a walk through a forest, and you see something like this, little marks on a tree. Maybe you pay attention, maybe you don't. You go another 50 meters, and you see this. You should be paying attention. Another 50 meters, if you haven't been paying attention, you see this. And at this point, you're paying attention. And you've just learned that this is important, it's relevant, because it means this. And anything that is related, any information related to your survival is stuff that you're going to pay attention to, and therefore you're going to remember it. If it's related to your own personal goals, then you're going to pay attention to it. If it's relevant, you're going to remember it. So the first rule, first principle for learning a language is focus on language content that is relevant to you, which brings us to tools. We master tools by using tools, and we learn tools the fastest when they're relevant to us. So let me share a story. A keyboard is a tool. L typing Chinese a certain way, there are methods for this, that's a tool. I had a colleague many years ago who Went to night school, Tuesday night, Thursday night, two hours each time, practicing at home. She spent nine months, and she did not learn to type Chinese. And one night we had a crisis. We had 48 hours to deliver a training manual in Chinese. And she got the job. And I can guarantee you, in 48 hours, she learned to type Chinese. Because it was relevant, it was meaningful, it was important. She was using a tool to create value. So the second principle for learning a language is to use your language as a tool to communicate right from day one, as a kid does. When I first arrived in China, I didn't speak a word of Chinese. And on my second week, I got to take a train ride overnight. I spent eight hours sitting in the dining car talking to one of the guards on the train. He took an interest in me for some reason. And we just chatted all night in Chinese. And he was drawing pictures and making movements with his hands and facial expressions. And piece by piece by piece, I understood more and more. But what was really cool was two weeks later, when people were talking Chinese around me, I was understanding some of this. And I hadn't even made any effort to learn that. What had happened, I'd absorbed it that night on the train, which brings us to the third principle. When you first understand the message, then you will acquire the language unconsciously. 
And this is really, really well documented now. It's something called comprehensible input. There's 20 or 30 years of research on this. Stephen Krashen, a leader in the field, has published all sorts of these different studies. And this is just from one of them. The, the purple bars show the scores on different tests for language. The green and the, the purple people were people who had learned by grammar and formal study. The green ones are the ones who learned by comprehensible input. So comprehension works. Comprehension is key. And language learning is not about accumulating lots of knowledge. In many, many ways, it's about physiological training. A woman I know from Taiwan did great in English at school. She got A grades all the way through, went through college, A grades, went to the US and found she couldn't understand what people were saying. And people starting ask, started asking her, are you deaf? And she was, English deaf. Because we have filters in our brain that filter in the sounds that we are familiar with, and they filter out the sounds of languages that we're not. And if you can't hear it, you won't understand it. If you can't understand it, you're not going to learn it. So you actually have to be able to hear these sounds. And you, there are ways to do that, but it's physiological training. Speaking takes muscle. You've got 43 muscles in your face. You have to coordinate those in a way that you make sounds that other people will understand. If you've ever done a new sport for a couple of days and you know how your body feels, hurts, if your face is hurting, you're doing it right. And the final principle is state, psychophysiological state. If you're sad, angry, worried, upset, you're not going to learn, period. If you're happy, relaxed, in an alpha brain state, curious, you're going to learn really quickly. And very specifically, you need to be tolerant of ambiguity. If you're one of those people who needs to understand 100% every word you're hearing, you will go nuts because you'll be incredibly upset all the time because you're not perfect. If you're comfortable with getting some, not getting some, just paying attention to what you do understand, you're going to be fine, you'll be relaxed, and you'll be learning quickly. So based on those five principles, what are the seven actions that you take? Number one, listen a lot. I call it brain soaking. You put yourself in a context where you're hearing tons and tons and tons of the language, and it doesn't matter if you understand it or not. You're listening to the rhythms. You're listening to patterns that repeat. You're listening to things that stand out. Ponards, are, so just soak your brain in this. The second action is you get the meaning first, even before you get the words. And you go, well, how do I do that? I don't know the words. Well, you understand what these different postures mean. Human communication is body language in many, many ways. So much body language. From body language, you can understand a lot of communication. Therefore, your understanding, you're acquiring through comprehensible input. And you can also use patterns that you already know. If you're a Chinese speaker of Mandarin and Cantonese, and you go to Vietnam, you will understand 60% of what they say to you in daily conversation. Because Vietnamese is about 30% Mandarin, 30% Cantonese. The third action, start mixing. You probably have never thought of this, but if you've got 10 verbs, 10 nouns, and 10 adjectives, you can say 1,000 different things. Right? Language is a creative process. What do babies do? Okay, me, but, now. Okay, that's how they communicate. So start mixing, get creative, have fun with it. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to work. And you, when you're doing this, you focus on the core. What does that mean? Well, with every language, there's high-frequency content. In English, 1,000 words covers 85% of anything you're ever going to say in daily communication. 3,000 words gives you 98% of anything you're going to say in daily conversation. You've got 3,000 words, you're speaking the language. The rest is, is icing on the cake. And when you're just beginning with a new language, start with your toolbox, week number one. In your new language, you say things like, how do you say that? I don't understand. Repeat that, please. What does that mean? All in your target language. You're using it as a tool, making it useful to you. It's relevant to learn other things about the language. By week two, you should be saying things like, me, this, you, that, give, you know, hot, 
simple pronouns, simple nouns, simple verbs, simple adjectives, communicating like a baby. And by the third or fourth week, you're getting into what I call glue words. Although, but, therefore, these are logical transformers that tie bits of a language together, allowing you to make more complex meaning. At that point, you're talking. And when you're doing that, you should get yourself a language parent. <clears throat> if you look at how children and parents interact, you understand what this means. When a child is speaking, it'll be using simple words, simple combinations, sometimes quite strange, sometimes very strange pronunciation. Other people from outside the family don't understand it. But the parents do. And so the kid has a safe environment, gets confidence. The parents talk to the children with body language and with simple language. They know the child understands. So you have a comprehensible input environment that's safe. We know it works, otherwise none of you would speak your mother tongue. So you get yourself a language parent who's somebody interested in you as a person who will communicate with you essentially as an equal, but pay attention to help you understand the message. There are four rules of a language parent. Spouses, by the way, are not very good at this, okay? But the four rules are, first of all, they will work hard to understand what you mean even when you're way off beat. Secondly, they will never correct your mistakes. Thirdly, they will feed back their understanding of what you're saying so that you can respond appropriately and, and get, the, get that feedback. And then they will use words that you know. The sixth thing you have to do is copy the face. You've got to get the muscles working right so you can sound in a way that people will understand you. There's a couple of things you do. One is you, you need to hear how it feels and feel how it sounds, which means you have a feedback loop operating in your face. But ideally, if you can look at a native speaker and just observe how they use their face, let your unconscious mind absorb the rules, then you're going to be able to pick it up. And if you can't get a native speaker to look at, you can use stuff like this. And the final idea here, the final action you need to take is something that I call direct connect. What does this mean? Well, most people learning a second language sort of take the mother tongue words and the target words and go over them again and again in their mind to try and remember them. Really inefficient. What you need to do is realize that everything you know is an image inside your mind, it's feelings. If you talk about fire, you can smell the smoke, you can hear the, the crackling, you can see the flames. So what you do is you go into that imagery and all of that memory and you come out with another pathway. So I call it one, same box, different path. You come out that pathway and you build it over time. You become more and more skilled and just connecting the new sounds to those images that you already have and to that internal representation. And over time, you even become naturally good at that process that becomes unconscious. So there are five principles that you need to work with, seven actions. If you do any of them, you're going to improve. And remember, these are things under your control as the learner. Do them all. You're going to be fluent in the second language in six months. Thank you. So about two years ago, I was featured in a New York Times article called Adventures of a Teenage Polyglot, which featured my passion for learning foreign languages, this peculiar hobby that I had. And at first, I thought it was great. I loved the fact that language learning was getting more attention. I loved the fact that what had always seemed like an isolating hobby was suddenly putting me into contact with people all around the world. Yet as I spent more time in the media spotlight, the focus of my story began to shift. So whereas I'd always been interested in talking about the why and the how, why I was learning foreign languages, how I did it, instead, it turned into a bit of a circus in which media uh, shows wanted to sensationalize my story. So it would go a little something like this. Hello, I'm here today with 17-year-old Timothy Donor, who is fluent in 20 languages. Oh, I I'm sorry. He actually can insult you in 25 languages and is fluent in another 10. Tim, uh, how about you tell our audience good morning and thank you for watching in Muslim? Uh, Arabic. Um, Great, Tim. Now, can we get you to introduce yourself and say, uh, I'm fluent in 23 languages in German? Uh, it's, it's not really true, but no, no, no. Just tell the audience. 
Hallo, ich bin Tim Donner, ich bin 17 Jahre alt und ich kann ungefähr äh, 23 Sprachen fließen sprechen. Perfect. Now, how about a, uh, a tongue twister in Chinese? <laughs> well, we could talk about Chinese. You know, a, a lot more Americans are learning Chinese these days, and I think there's a lot of value in that. No, 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 just give us a tongue twister. <laughs> This guy. Uh, Tim, how about another tongue twister in Chinese? I would prefer not to, but uh, you know, we could talk about China. You know, there's a lot that you can gain by learning a language. Oh, Tim, I'm sorry, that's all the time we have. <laughs> Now, why don't you tell our audience goodbye in Turkish, and we'll be over here. You know, we haven't talked about anything substantive, but Turkish, please. Haydi bakalım. Tamam. Güle güle ve çok teşekkür ederim. How about that kid, right? Wonder if he gets any girls. <laughs> Now, stay with us, because up next, a skateboarding bulldog in a bathing suit. <laughs> So, as funny as that was, it highlighted two pretty major problems in the way my story was covered. On a personal level, I felt that language learning was now becoming like a bit of a, a, a task, almost. It felt, it felt like something that was suddenly, had to be rigidly, uh, rigidly organized, something that had to be compartmentalized, rationalized, expressed in a concrete number. I speak X languages, I know Y languages, as opposed to what I'd always done, which was just learning languages for the fun of it learning to communicate with people, learning about foreign cultures. And on a bigger level, it cheapened what it meant to speak a language or to know a language. Now, if I can impart you with anything today at TEDx Teen, it's that knowing a language is a lot more than knowing a couple words out of a dictionary. It's a lot more than being able to ask someone where the bathroom is or telling them the time of day. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So for those of you who aren't familiar with my story, maybe a lot of you here don't know what the word polyglot is, and pretty weird one. I started here. So this little tot is me, circa 2001. And this is the beginning of my language learning journey. I actually was a child actor before I learned any languages. And I always had a little bit of a gift for accents. So I would go into auditions for radio commercials or for TV commercials, and I would do an Austin Powers impression. I'm not going to do one now. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe I would do Apu from The Simpsons. Uh, in fact, there was actually one time in an audition in which I was asked to leave because they told me to speak like a little kid with a lisp, and I wanted to do Darth Vader in a French accent. <laughs> But that taught me the basics of how to break down sound, how to pick up a foreign accent or foreign speech patterns, and really live with it. Now, fast forward a little bit. I'm now in about third grade, and I've just started French for the first time. But six months into it, a year into it, even two years later, I can't converse with anybody. French is just another subject in school, and even though I can tell you words for elbow, knee bone, shoelace, I couldn't really have a fluent conversation with anybody. Fast forward a little bit more. In seventh grade, I started Latin. So Latin, of course, is a dead language. And in learning Latin, you really learn how to break down language, to see language as a system with rules and as a bit of a puzzle. So that was great. but. I still didn't feel like language was for me. So forward a little bit more. I'm about 13, and out of an interest in learning more about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I started studying Hebrew. Now, I had no way of doing it. I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. So I listened to a lot of rap music. I'd memorize lyrics. I'd spit them back out. And I would just try to chat with native speakers once a week, once a month. And I found that incrementally, I started to understand a lot more. Now, I didn't sound like a native speaker. I couldn't speak very articulately, and I certainly didn't know the grammar. But I had done what I had never managed to do in school, which was to pick up the basics of a language all on my own. Forward a little bit more. I started taking Arabic when I was 14 in a summer program going into ninth grade. This was summer of 2010. After a month, I found that I could read and write without a problem. I learned the basics of the formal language and one of its major dialects. And it turned me on to the fact that I really could pursue languages as a hobby. So, It finally came to March 24th, 2011. So I have pretty vicious insomnia. And as I was studying more languages, uh, using grammar books or watching TV shows in, let's say, Arabic or Hebrew became one way of focusing my time. 
So on that night, while I was awake till some ungodly hour, I recorded myself speaking Arabic into my computer screen, subtitled it, and I uploaded it to YouTube under the title, Tim Speaks Arabic. Tim Yatkalim Al Arabiya. Next day, I did the same thing. Tim Tim Speaks Hebrew. And the comments, when they trickled in, were fantastic. I got things like, wow, I've never seen an American speak Arabic before. <laughs> you blame them? Um, in addition to that, I got things like, wow, maybe you should, you should fix your vowels here. Or maybe this word is pronounced this way. So suddenly, language learning had gone from the solitary pages of a book or my computer screen into the wide world. After that, I was hooked. I had a, a community of speakers to interact with, and I essentially had a teacher or conversational partners for any language that I wanted to do. So I'll show you a quick montage of that. That became my way of reaching out to the world. But as I was learning all these languages, I faced a number of obstacles. So number one, I had no idea how to teach myself. In fact, I'm sure many of you, if you were told you have to learn Pashto by next month, you wouldn't know what to do. So I experimented. Here's one thing. So in my Latin class, I read about something that Cicero described called method of loci, or technically locorum. But it's a technique in which you take mnemonics. So let's say you want to learn 10 vocab words on a list. You take each of those words, and instead of memorizing them in blocks, you integrate them into your spatial memory. So here's what I mean. This spot right here is Union Square. It's a place I go every day. If I close my eyes, I can imagine it very, very vividly. So I imagine myself walking down Union Square, and at each spot in my mind that has resonance, I associate it with a vocab word. I'll show you right now. I'm walking down Park Avenue, and in Japanese, to walk is iku. I go a little bit further, turn right, sit on the steps where I can suwaru. Directly north of there is a statue of George Washington, which I used to think was a fountain. So that's nomu, to drink. Right next to that is a tree that you can kiru, cut. If you want to go north to a Barnes & Noble, you can yomu, to read. Or if I'm hungry and I want to go to my favorite falafel place, I can go one block west of there so I can taberu, to eat. Did I miss one? All right, so eight out of 10. Not bad. So I found that most of the time, by experimenting with methods like these, it made language learning a much more interactive experience. It made it something that I could remember much better and I had a lot of fun with. Maybe that's not for you. Here's another one. So a lot of people often ask me, if you're studying so many languages at the same time, how do you not confuse them? Or how do you learn so many vocab words? In Spanish, I learn the word for table, and then the word for book goes out the other ear. What I do is embrace those. So for example, Take these three words in Indonesian. These were actually among the first 50 words that I learned. Kapala, kabar, kantor. Lexically, they're unrelated to each other. <laughs> Kapala is a head, kabar is news, kantor is an office. But they all sound similar, K-A, right? So what I would do is I would memorize vocab in batches of sounds that were similar. So if I hear the word kapala in Indonesian, I automatically think the words kabar and kantor. Same in Arabic, iqtisad, istiklal, sukut. Those three words are unrelated. One is economy, one is independence, one is downfall. But if I hear one, it triggers. <laughs> it triggers the rest. <laughs> Same thing in Hebrew, chozel, zochel, zorech, even though those are return, remember, and to shine. Or in Farsi, uh, in which they are related. So for me, if I hear the word pedar, which means father, I automatically think of the words modar, marodar, dochtar, mother, brother, daughter. So again, this is one method. And I'm not saying this will make you fluent in a language, but it has been one of my ways of overcoming those obstacles. So you may be wondering, what's the point in doing this? Why learn Pashto or Ojibwe when you live in New York? And there's a point to that. In fact, I've lived in New York my entire life, and I'm always blown away by the number of languages you can hear on a given day. Walking down the street, I see billboards in Chinese or in Spanish. I see Russian bookstores, Indian restaurants, Turkish bathhouses. Yet for all that linguistic diversity, mainstream American culture remains decidedly monolingual. And if you don't think that's true, look at the reactions to Coca-Cola's Super Bowl video. 
So as I started to play around more with language learning, I found that I had my own community of learners here in New York. I would go out to outer boroughs and, for lack of a better word, embarrass myself. I tried to talk to people all day, get their views on things, and use my newfound language skills. Как вас зовут? Натан. Натан. Это я как зовут? Привет. Я Тим. 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 Очень приятно. Очень приятно. Откуда вы? Из китайского языка я имею в виду, что это книга, которую ты делаешь, чтобы ты не вышел. Ага. It, or Navis, Navis, yeah, right? Writer? Right. Oh, was, was, was written. Uh, about, uh, about uh, his own uh, life. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, Khud Navis. Khud Navis. Khud Navis. Khud Navis. Yes. So maybe you have to use a lot of English. Maybe you're not really that articulate or interesting when you talk. But the point is you're getting out there and you're getting exposure. So I don't speak Urdu that well. It was a kind of awkward conversation. But just from that, I have learned a new word, Khud Navis. I'm not going to forget it now. So moving on, you may wonder, Again, what's the point of doing this? And I try to explain to people a lot what my various motivations are, but I often feel that this quote from Nelson Mandela is the best expression of that. If you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. So as I've begun to see, there's an enormous connection between language and culture, language and thought. And quite honestly, if you want to learn Persian, for example. You pick up a dictionary and you say, I know how to say thank you, I know how to say how much is this, and I know how to say goodbye. Oh, I speak Persian. Probably not. Let's see, actually. In fact, if you want to buy something in a Persian bookstore, you might ask someone, how much is this? Generally, they'll tell you this, which means. <laughs> so in fact, this is an ingrained cultural practice called ta'arof, in which two people having a conversation both try to behave more humble than the other. So if I go to buy a book, it's rude for that person to tell me it's five bucks. He has to say, it's worthless, please. You are so good looking, you're so talented, you're whatever. Take it for free. I'm so humble, take it for free. <laughs> or you might find something like this phrase. If you want to thank somebody, if you want to show your gratitude towards them or say nice to meet you, I could say, well, I know how to say thank you in Farsi. I speak Farsi. Maybe not, though. In fact, I've often heard this phrase when I talk with Iranians, Vorban et beram which literally means. <laughs> so again, it's poetic. You might call it melodramatic. But this is something you really have to understand the culture to get. Now, right, and again, I don't want to exoticize this, because think about it. We have this in English all the time. If you ask somebody, how are you, what are you expecting to hear? I'm fine. If you tell me anything else, I'm not interested. But we do it anyway. We say, we say, bless you, even though that has no real religious connotation now when people sneeze, right? So it's interesting if you think about the fact that most linguists believe language doesn't inherently affect the way you think, right? There's no language that'll make you a math genius. There's no language that'll make logic problems impossible to understand. But there's a real tie between language and culture. There's so much language can tell you about one culture's mindset. And in fact, on planet Earth, every two weeks, another language dies. No more people are speaking it because of war, because of famine, oftentimes just because of assimilation. Maybe it's easier for me not to speak my village language, but to speak Arabic, let's say. Or maybe I'm from a tribe in the Amazon, my habitat is cut down, and it just makes more sense for me to learn Portuguese and lose my culture. So think about that. Two months from today is April 1st. For many of you, that date may be stressful because you have a paper due, or the rent is due. But for two groups of people around the world, for two cultures, that means the death of their language, the death of their mythology, their history, their folklore, their understanding of the world. Now again, you brushing up on your Spanish, going to Japanese class, is not going to stop language death. But what it does do is begin to open up your mind to the idea that language, in its sense, in essence, represents a cultural worldview. And if I can impart you with anything today at TEDx Teen, it's this. You can translate words easily, but you can't quite translate meaning. Thank you. <laughs>